Hey, it's Coach Tori, and this is Raising Runners. We will be talking about running, mental health, youth sport burnout, specialization in sports, motivation, encouragement, coaching, parenting, sleep, nutrition, really anything that you can think of that we as parents or coaches or just runners can do to help our young athletes. Welcome to season two. And yes, this is still Coach Tori. Yes, I've been sick. Um, had to cancel our first practice probably in forever um, because I was sick. So here I am just still with no voice. Um, but it's season two. So we are going to be getting into more in-depth topics, being a little more focused. Um, I do still have some of our interview series coming out. They're going to be some bonus episodes probably coming out on Thursdays when I have some, but we are moving on to get a little more focused, give you some more knowledge. So our first guest is going to be Alan Ladd from The Running Rules. He is going to talk to us all about nutrition and fueling for runners. So he breaks down some basics of how we as runners should be fueling. Um, He also talks about different race distances and how we should be fueling for those during. Um, He also talks about fueling for recovery. He definitely gets into some of the science-y talk, um, which is really great. So he gives us lots of really good information. So uh, listen up and you can learn a lot about nutrition. All right. So, um, we kind of talked a little bit, but if you want to start by kind of saying who you are, but then also, um, I guess we could get right into just like general tips for fueling first, and then we'll get you know a little deeper into it. Yeah, sure. Um, my name's Alan Ladd. Um, I'm a running coach and nutritionist. I'm founder of the running rules. That's my coaching brand um and i coach runners but specifically mostly marathoners at the moment um and i run marathons myself um i'm running my 10th marathon this year in london and um, so i'm looking forward to that but nutrition has been a massive changing point for me over my marathon um journey when I started out, my first marathon was 20 years ago now, and I didn't know what I was doing really. Um, I was lucky the first one. I think I just managed to get through it and nothing went wrong. Um, on my second marathon though, I collapsed at mile 25 because uh, I decided that I was going to, I'd actually had a half marathon the year before where I had decided I was going to take a gel at mile eight. They were just offering them on the course. And I'd taken that gel and I hadn't had any water. I'd never had a gel before. So I took this gel and I uh, it was just really sort of sick and sickly and sweet and just stuck in my mouth. And for the rest of that half marathon, um, I was just, there was no water nearby. I was just really struggling with that gel. Um, so first thing not to do is take um, a gel on the course if you haven't tried it. That was the first mistake. So then the second mistake was I went into the next marathon. No one told me that for a marathon, fueling is so important because um, to put it into context, um, you have about 2000 calories worth of storage for carbohydrate in the body. And a marathon usually is going to take about 3000 calories. So you, you do use some fat in that. And some people are better at using fat as well as carbohydrate for fueling that marathon. So you might be lucky and get to the end without fueling. Some people can do that, but most people are going to hit the wall at some point in the marathon if they don't fuel. And I decided that I'm not going to take anything because I don't know how, how I'm going to take, how it's going to react with me or how I'm going to find it um and by mile 20 I was getting very woozy um I couldn't really think straight um I couldn't really feel my legs um and I was going on and on and was just trying to get to the end um a mile 25 I just couldn't keep 
keep on my feet anymore, my legs. I don't know if you've ever seen someone who, who this has happened to on video, the legs just really go to jelly and they just go down like a sack of spuds. And that's what happened to me. Um, so that was a, a bit of a wake up call. Like, <laughs> that's something not to do in marathon. So I went back and looked at what you should do and, and, and fueling for marathons. So it was a bit more successful in my next one. Um, and then I got better and better and it, it got me into looking at, uh, at getting some kind of nutrition qualification and understanding nutrition a bit more. So um, fueling, if you, do you want me to talk about fueling for races first? Um, yeah, sure. Because I guess that's kind of where we're at. You're talking about your failures in fueling, right? So might as well. Um, wow, that phone call was loud. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, we can definitely get into that. Um, seems like a good segue. Yeah, so if we start with race fueling, um, I'll back up slightly because um, I already mentioned um, you've got carbohydrates that you use for fuel as well as fats. And you can also use protein. The body can use protein as well, but it's not, it's not the body's preferred fuel source. In fact, it's, it's, you know, it's the last resort really. So the three macronutrients as we, as you would call them, are the carbohydrate, fat, and protein. And fat is going to be able to fuel low intensity work. So anytime you're just sitting around doing anything or even just walking at low intensity or even, even jogging at low intensity, that's going to be fueled primarily by fat stores. Next, after that, um, you start using carbohydrate when the intensity gets higher. So that can be with oxygen or without oxygen. So aerobic with oxygen or anaerobic without oxygen. Um, that allows you when you're really working very hard that you still be able to get fuel uh, to the muscles. Um, you can still get the energy that you need to keep that intensity going for a short time without using any oxygen. So if you think of it on a sliding scale, the more and more intensity you build up, the more, um, the more fuel you need from different sources. And eventually, if that can't be met, then you'll start breaking down protein. So that's not really what you want. It's you're going to start using things like muscle in there. So fueling for races, if you are going for a long time, you can probably fuel a lot of that off fat if you're going slow. So ultra marathoners, um, I've done a couple of ultras myself. Um, you can start thinking about eating more sort of normal foods. Um, anything that's going to be able to be relatively easily digested, but it's not necessarily, you don't have to stick to necessarily um, fast acting fuels because you're going to be burning a lot of fat at the same time, but you, you will need carbohydrate as well. So you can basically eat anything. If you've been to an ultra race and seen the aid stations there, you'd see all sorts of things that people have. So I think things like boiled potatoes with salt on is quite a common one but you could take sandwiches with you you could take um biscuits rice cakes anything like that um working back then for a marathon um you will need more fuel than you can store in your muscles so it is important to for anything um that long you need to be fueling through it. Otherwise you run the risk of just running out of energy and hitting the wall. So for marathons, if you're working at a higher intensity, it's often harder to take in real solid food, but it's still an option for some people. Um, maybe if you're, it's very different running a three hour marathon, for instance, from a six hour marathon, because Obviously, six hours, you're out for a lot longer. You're probably not working quite as hard for the entire time because you're out there for a lot longer. You're also probably going to be missing a meal time in there. So again, solid food is possible um, for longer marathons. And even for shorter marathons, I used to use um, bars as well as gels. So things like um, cereal bars, I would have used um, 
The only problem I found with that is that they can be a bit dry and hard to take unless you've got you know a lot of water there. So then you're looking at um, for for a bit higher intensity, bit shorter race, you're looking at um, easy, fast acting carbohydrates, so things like gels and sports drinks, um, and these are usually um, just going to be purely sugar carbohydrates. So either going to be glucose or fructose or a combination of the two. And they are, they are specifically designed to be fast acting so that you can get that fuel to your muscles quickly. And the thing I would say is to test different products because although they're relatively made up of the same, same underlying ingredients, they'll have different textures or different flavors and people will like different ones. Some they won't be able to stomach necessarily. Um, so do try a different range of ones. Um, and then the other thing is how much you want to take. So the recommendations are quite high. Um, they have been done on, most studies have been done on um, faster athletes, but the recommendations are between 60 and 90 grams of carbohydrate per hour when you're running over two and a half hours. So for most of us, that's going to be marathon distance is going to be over two and a half hours. Um, so to put that into context, that's usually about two to three gels every hour. So test this as well on your runs because that's quite a lot. So I think for slower runners, that's quite a lot to take. So for if you're running a four, five, six hour marathon, that's going to be a lot of gels to take with you. So probably a little bit or to the bottom end of that that recommendation is going to be good or even a bit lower than that if you're running for less than that so between an about an hour and two and a half hours so most people's half marathon time the recommendation is 30 to 60 grams of carbohydrate an hour is not so so critical in a half marathon because you won't run out of fuel probably if you're running a half marathon, because that's going to, if you fueled well beforehand, you're probably going to have enough to get through it, but it's not going to be optimal if you don't top that up as you're going through. Um, and then anything under an hour is fine to fuel without anything at all. So you don't need to be taking any gels for anything under an hour. Um, you might want to have a, a little sip of something, um, I haven't talked about water or electrolytes. That's a different, a different uh, part of the the picture. But for, in terms of fueling, in terms of the actual energy to get you through, you should have enough to get through an hour of exercise. Okay, I have so many questions because I also feel like that was so sciency that I right I say things like sciency so obviously a lot of that could have gone over my head um I guess to start okay so gels are the is that what you think most people would want to use just because they are the easiest to access and it has like the perfect ish combination of everything that you need. Is there some, I know you mentioned like, you know, cereal bars or anything else, but are there other options yeah. for people who want something different, like a different kind of texture or something like that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, a lot of people don't like gels actually from my experience, although they are very convenient and that's why I would suggest for marathons especially, um, trying those first because, like you say, they they are convenient. Um, the idea of a gel is that you are packing quite a lot of fuel into a small space that you can carry. Um, you do need to take them. Most of them you do need to take with water. It does depend on the gel. But if they're not isotonic, which means if they don't have the the right um, carbohydrate to water consistency, then they will start to dehydrate you and they'll actually draw water into the stomach to try and dilute the gel. So some of them you have to be careful about. You do need to take 
water with them and you do need to take water anyway because you want to be hydrating throughout if you lose a lot of water through sweat um then you run the risk of dehydration and even a small amount of dehydration can impact your performance um, but going back to gels they are a good option because of the portability and their con their convenience other options are out there though you could if you are going to be carrying um water or fuel you could have um bottles or a camelback with some kind of pre-made uh liquid in it so there's a couple of ones that i know of but basically sports drinks are going to be the equivalent of that they're they're still the same ingredients really but they're made up with a lot more water so that they have you know that they have the right combination of water and fuel but the problem there is that you've got to carry a lot of liquid then and it's not very convenient you don't really want to be carrying that extra weight on your back or on on your front wherever you're carrying that um if you look to the elites what they do is they have all their bottles set up at the different different aid stations ready for them to grab so they can they can have their liquid set out for them so that's why they've got an advantage over that, us um when we're running ourselves we don't have that option unless you can plant people around the course that you know you're going to see but that can go wrong as well if you miss them then your fueling strategy goes out of the window. Other options that I would I would consider, and I have used before, so I talked about the cereal bars, any kind of bar that's made up primarily of um, carbohydrate. So a good thing that you can, you can make your own bars actually. Uh, and I've, I've tried doing this before and always come back to the gels because they're a bit easy, <laughs> a bit easier, but you can make um, bars with date is quite a good um, ingredient to use in a bar because you can mush that up, you can blend it, and it's it's pretty much all carbohydrate. There's a bit of fiber in there, which is is not ideal because that can cause a bit of GI distress. But date is a good um, source of um, carbohydrate. You can also make them with um sort of corn flour and sugar and things like this um and and bind it together with a little bit of something like coconut oil or fat so you could make make something like that and that would be some kind of energy ball probably put a bit of cocoa powder in there to make it a bit more palatable um for real foods you could go to something like i used to use bananas um because they're quite easy to chew down um got a nice texture again they're a bit bulky um but that's that's an option um and other options like i say you could you you could still use real foods um if you're going to go for real foods again you're looking at something that's very easily digested so something like a white bread sandwich with jam in it or something like that that's going to be really easy to get down and has a lot of carbohydrates so there are other options in there dried fruit is another one because they're that's quite a solid form of um sugar in there so anything that you can think that is quite quite sugary and the obvious one also that i've missed out is um sweet people use things like jelly babies or um jelly beans things like that haribo sweets things Anything that you can think that you don't give that much to your kids of is probably fair game for, for fueling for a marathon. So you mentioned um, your stomach turning at some point, I think. And I know everyone's probably familiar with like those unfortunate pictures of like a marathon or at the end of their race and, you know, it's all coming out their shorts, right? Um, or throwing up to like those things happen. And um, everyone I've talked to who has done ultras mentioned that at some point, you know, food just was not working, but you obviously like you're talking about the need to have food. Um, are there specific things that you need to, or that you could use 
to help with that. Like obviously testing out certain foods, make sure things usually agree with you in your training, but you know, racing is just a whole different beast. So are there like stomach friendly things or like do this once your stomach's already unhappy? Yeah, sure. That's, that's a great question. Um, and if I had the golden answer to that, then I'd be, (laughs) I'd be a rich man, but I think, I think you touched on it. I think knowing what you can tolerate is, is one thing. I mean, stomach issues can come from a lot of, a lot of problems. Being nervous is, is not a good thing to, for your stomach. You can, you can get problems just from being nervous and that will happen can happen to you on race day um so it's good to test these things under pressure as well so in test races uh, as well as just in training there are definitely things though that i would uh, i would encourage to avoid um even leading up to a race so the couple of days before i would start cutting out quite a lot of specific things so things like spicy food, um, anything that's going to be high in fiber um, can cause problems for certain people. So um, unfortunately, that's things like um, fruits and vegetables, um, whole grains. So you're starting just coming up to the marathon a couple of days before. If you are doing a carb load, which is trying to eat more carbohydrate, trying to make that low in fiber. So from so white white rice and white pasta, bread, um, pancakes, sweets, um, energy drinks, things like this, all things that sound like a complete horror show of a diet uh, is probably a good way of getting the fuel that you need in without causing yourself too much distress. For some people, fructose can be a problem, which is a type of sugar that you would find in fruit. Um, so that could be an issue for some people. So dried fruit might be an issue. Honey is a really good source, but that is quite high in fructose as well. So it, it's quite quite um, saturated with, with sugar as well. So I would use that on pancakes and crumpets and, and bread because it's you get quite a lot of carbohydrate in there for not much honey. But again, that's got fructose in. So for some people test that and it might be an issue but not for everyone um and then cutting down on 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 fat fatty foods because fat takes longer to digest so it can sit in your stomach um so any any sort of fatty meat you know full fat dairy and things like that are maybe going to cause problems so for instance pizza would be a good night before meal that i would have but if i was ever having that i would cut down on on the cheese on that because that can be quite stodgy and in your stomach protein isn't too bad and you should probably keep protein um, intake quite consistent throughout Uh, it does take longer to digest as well but it doesn't sit as heavy and there's not as much of it as as fat sometimes can sit there so um the, the key things that I would I would say to cut out are spicy foods, fiber fiber foods, high fiber foods, and um, fatty foods. Um, and then on the day, um, the same thing beforehand when the same kind of foods before the race, and then during the race, making sure that you have tested that um, during training but also during other races and making sure that you are taking enough water for your gels for instance so that you don't have that um, dehydration or or gels sitting in your stomach with drawing water and try and try and dissolve them so there's different things that you can try um also try different gels because like I say that they they often have different consistencies and don't think that you have to stick to the same fuel throughout the whole race and that's a mistake I've made before especially in ultras I thought I'm going to stick with this one product and then if it's particularly long event you can suddenly just go off it and that is the worst thing if 
you get to a point and then you've no backup plan as as regard to nutrition and you just stop taking any calories in because that can really derail your race or, or event after that so for marathons i have quite thick gels at the start but i know by the end i'm not going to be able to and i'll not want to take those thick sticky gels anymore so i have other ones that have a bit more water in them or a bit bit lighter in consistency towards the end of a race so there's definitely ways of mixing and matching things and if you're running an ultra you can definitely usually use those aid stations or you're you're going to have a lot more options as to what fuel you can take on in an ultra backtracking a little bit um, you mentioned carb loading which to me is when we were in high school cross country we would all have like the team dinner on the night before our meet everybody would have pasta meatballs garlic bread um is that like an accurate depiction of what it should be should it be a longer period of time um how should that really look yeah the, <clears throat> sorry it depends on the length of the race a bit. Um, so, and it also depends on what you've tried before again. Um, you don't want to be trying to do a carb load if you've never done it before. So I think people's idea of carb load varies quite dramatically. Um, my own interpretation of it way back was basically just start eating loads more um, of everything around you. And like I say, that's not necessarily the best idea because if you're eating the wrong types of foods, um, you can start to feel really bloated um, and it's not really very helpful um, going into a, a big race, feeling sluggish. Um, so the research suggests that you should start your carb load around about 48 hours out. If you're doing a marathon, 48 to 72 hours out. So two or three days before, if it's if it's a shorter race, like a half marathon, and you're going to do a bit of a carb load, then maybe one one day out is enough. And you, you're going to be upping your carbohydrate intake, um, but probably some of that is going to be offset by a reduction in fat. So you're not necessarily eating a lot more calories but you're just eating, you're just shifting which kind of calories you're eating. Um, carbohydrate is the guidelines for how much carbohydrate is somewhere between seven to 12 grams per kilogram of body weight. So for me, I'm relatively average weight, I would think for a man, it's about 600 to a, a thousand um, grams of carbohydrate, which is quite a lot that's two and a half thousand calories to four thousand calories of carbohydrate and um, so you can see why that's quite difficult to get in if you're also eating a lot of fat as well and um, so it used to be the case that people thought that by depleting the amount of carbohydrate you had in the early in the week and then building it back up at the end of the week that was more beneficial but recently um, studies have shown that there's there's not really any difference between doing the down cycle and then the up cycle. So you really only need to worry about the last few days leading up to your event. And that is when you start adding more of these carbohydrates. And in practical terms, that could look like just slightly bigger portions at your normal meal times, but then adding carbohydrate snacks or primarily carbohydrate snacks between um, your meals. So you might have a couple of extra snacks. Um, I like to have a um, bowl of cornflakes maybe at, at bedtime. I find that's a good time to get extra an extra snack in that I wouldn't normally do. Um, but you, you could have, um, like I say, pancakes or crumpets or things like that in between meals to get those extra um, calories in. But yes, just eating a lot more of everything is not necessarily the best way to go about it. Um, and again, it, it does take trial and error. And to, to be honest, some people just don't have the time or the inclination to work all of this out. And as long as you are fueling well up, up to those days, uh, up to the marathon, 
or whatever your long event is, then you're probably going to be okay. The idea of the carb load is just to saturate as much in into your muscles as possible. Um, but if you, as long as you fueled well, you probably only going to notice a slight bit of difference if you weren't fueling well in the race as well. So hopefully if you're fueling well during the race, then that's going to top up whatever you've got there anyway. So it, it's all about mitigating the risk of hitting the wall. So if you can't get the carb load right, then get your make sure your race nutrition is right. Um, the carb load will help that if your race nutrition goes wrong. So it's kind of a backup plan for that. Um, but don't do a, a carb load if you've never done it before um, for your next marathon. Like Just go straight into it because you're not sure, not sure how you're going to feel probably by eating all of that extra food. Um, so you, you do need to sort of test these things out as always. I like that you keep reiterating that you have to like trial and error because I feel like so many, especially new runners, you know, we keep mm -hmm. all the things like carb load gels, all these things, or we see the table at mile 16 that has this new whatever. And you're like, I should just try that. Um, so I love that you just keep reminding us that that is not the way to go. Um, switching a little bit to recovery. Um, what kind of fueling? Because I know, especially for like those long races, like ultras, I know people can take a long time, relatively a long time off from running or even a marathon, you should take a little bit of time off. Um, does fueling look a little different in like a recovery state as well? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, fueling after the race um, is really important if you've got another race or you need to get straight back into it because the recovery window is going to be longer if you don't fuel optimally after the race. Most people, though, are going to have some downtime. And it's just nice when you finish a race to just be able to enjoy yourself and, and not really have to think, right, I need to do this and that and the other. And it's probably what the elites do have to go through is, right, I need to be straight back on it and I need to know I need to get this amount of carbohydrate in and this amount of protein. And for most of us, to be honest, when we finish the big race, we probably just want to let our hair down a bit and, and not worry about it too much. But there's definitely a few things that you can, you can do. The things that are going to be depleted are, like I've said before, the muscle glycogen that you've stored, the carbohydrate in there will be depleted um, when you've finished a long race. So getting the carbohydrate back in will just refuel those muscles and it will just make you feel a bit a bit more human to be honest um even after long runs at the weekend i found that if i don't get carbohydrate back in on the same day i'll still be tired the next day i'll be sluggish the next day i'll still be hungry the next day and that's your body basically telling you you know you you've taken a lot out of it and you haven't put it back in um, so carbohydrates important. Protein is also important. Um, protein is the macronutrient that that um, repairs the muscle damage that you've done. And whilst running isn't the same as maybe doing something like strength work or you know lifting weights where you're really tearing down that muscle quite a lot um, quicker, you're still tearing down a lot of microfibers by the repeated trauma of of pounding on on your feet and all the other muscles that contribute to making that happen so protein is important it's not actually critical to necessarily get that in in a certain time frame as it would be if you're trying to build muscle from um strength training but the recommendation is that you space your protein intake out through the day and usually what that looks like is three to five servings throughout the day, roughly three to five hours apart. So for most longer races, such as marathons and endure or ultra races, that means you probably won't have got any protein in, in that window. So as soon as you start, uh, as soon as you stop, it's probably a good idea to get that back, some of that back in as soon as you can because that'll help again the recovery process 
Um, so it's not necessarily a window as such after the exercise that's important. It's just the time that's elapsed since the last time you've had any protein. Um, and you won't have those amino acids or the proteins that you had from the previous meal still circulating in your body. So that's why protein is, is important as well. But in terms of, you know, between if you if you don't have anything planned for the next week, it's not critically important. It's just the faster you do it, you won't feel quite as, you know, tired and lethargic afterwards. If you do have something coming up, that's when it gets really important to try get straight back on it and re refuel as fast as you can so that you can get back up to that next event. That, that is super helpful. Um, and as you were saying, like the protein part, I was immediately remembering when I used to do CrossFit and always was like, you have to have some kind of protein 30 minutes after you're done your workout. I'm like, I won't even be home yet. Like, how was that? So I'm glad that you also like explain that distinction because, um, I think a lot of us hear that even, you know, outside of a CrossFit gym, even just like in our regular gym, if we're running there and stuff. So that was, that was super helpful going now completely. And I'm like, keep jumping all over the place. That must be my brain today. Right. Um, completely the opposite direction for, I mean, I have been a runner forever, so I don't think I ever noticed, but I see, especially on Facebook, like new runners say like, I am hungry all the time since I started running or since I upped my mileage, I'm hungry all the time. And obviously, I mean, everything you explained today is you know, great guidelines for fueling, but is there, does that actually balance out usually? Or do you think we as runners just become better at figuring out what we need or is like, can you explain that phenomenon? If it even is a phenomenon, but I can explain that a little bit. Yeah, sure. Um, I think, I think there's a distinction definitely between, I think a lot of people get into running to try and lose weight. Um, and that's not necessarily the best tool for losing weight. I would, I would, I would have not said the same thing probably four or five years ago, because to be honest, when I got a bit more serious about running, that was one of the considerations because I had a desk job at the time. Um, I was getting into my thirties and I thought I need to, I need to be active and that's going to be a nice sort of side benefit is that I'm going to lose weight. And I did go through a period of thinking, you know, the lighter you are, the faster you're going to be. And I've, I've since learned that that's not a good, first of all, it's not a good message to put out to anyone. And secondly, it's just not true because I've got a bit heavier now because I've got stronger, I've built muscle, um, through my running and also through the the strength training that I've done around that and I've got faster whilst you know getting a bit heavier again so it's not it's not about weight at all um but I think people when they first get into running can if they're not used to it can feel hungry and that's why it's not necessarily a great weight loss tool because it's quite easy to um burn a, a few hundred calories running and then immediately eat that back so what i would say to very beginner runners is just work out what you what your average calorie burn should be throughout the day and focus on or focus on the nutrition and don't worry about the extra running uh try and focus on that calorie goal and then any running is going to be a benefit if you're not running that much it's you know you're not going to burn a huge amount of calories like my rule of thumb is about 80 to 100 calories per mile. So if you're only doing, you know, five to 10 miles a week, you're not burning a huge amount of extra calories through the week than you would normally be because you're probably going to be burning somewhere between 1,500 to 2,500 calories every day. And you're only going to burn another 500 or 1,000 a week um, if you're running five to, five to 10 miles in the week. So it's not a huge amount. Now take that a bit further on when, when you start getting a bit more serious about running and you're upping your miles, then you need to definitely offset those extra miles that you're running with, um, with extra calories, especially if weight loss isn't your goal and performance is your goal. Um, and those two things need, in my mind, should be distinct. If you're, if you're a 
goal is weight loss, then the running should just be there to keep you fit, keep, you know, improve your mental health, your cardiovascular health, not be used as a weight loss tool, but use the nutrition for the, for the weight loss. If you, if performance is your goal, then, then you don't want to be losing weight at the same time, because as, as we've said before, if you're not fueled properly, then that will affect performance. But worse than that, you can run into other problems because if you're not putting enough energy into the system, then your body only has a certain amount of energy to use on the excess, the extra running, the extra exercise that you're doing, but also everything else. So your bone health, um, your menstrual health and things like um, just your immune system. So that's why if you, if you on the fuel, you can end up with injuries, um, missing cycles, you can end up with colds and things like that. So it is really important when you ramp up the miles and you become more focused on performance and um, increasing your running that you do offset that. And like I say, I would use the rule of thumb of 80 to 100 calories per mile extra. So if you're doing an extra 20 miles in the week, that's going to be roughly, roughly 2000 calories, which is an extra 300 calories a day. Um, so it's not an insignificant amount at that point. Um, so I think that answers the question. Is there anything else you asked in that? No, that was perfect because I think you touched on kind of every, what my actual question was and then everything else that would go along with it, like the message of not being lighter. Cause I think us as runners, we still are so stuck in, I don't know if that was like 10, 15 years ago. That was all everyone ever was thinking about was just like being as light as possible. So I love that you also touched on that too. We are getting close to the end of our time. Otherwise we're going to be going on to a whole other episode. So, because I'm sure there's things I didn't ask you, is there anything real quick that you want to add before you tell us where we can find you? Um, I don't think so. Um, yeah, there's a whole load of things that we didn't talk about. So. <laughs> um, I did have some thoughts, but they're kind of not related. So we'll maybe leave those for a, a different time. But yeah, just I think I want to just reiterate that last point because it's something that I definitely a few years ago thought I'm going to get lighter and lighter and I'm going to keep on getting faster and faster. And that I still feel guilty that I thought that and said that to people at the time. And I want to sort of be really clear that, you know, there is probably an optimum weight that you can be at. And if you are not at that and you want to lose weight, then that's great. Don't be, don't try and do that at the same time as striving for a performance goal, like, uh, you know, running a, a PB in the marathon or anything like that, because you will struggle to do both and probably not hit either. Um, so it's really important to, separate the two and when you are fully focused on performance and trying to run further and faster then that you do fuel properly and make sure that you're not losing weight at the same time that is kind of the indication that uh, if you're losing weight then that's the indication that you're not fueling enough for that extra mileage or extra pace that you're putting into your your plan um so yeah, that's the that's kind of the last point I want to to leave on. But um, I'm at the Running Rules everywhere. So my website is www.theRunningRules.com, and I'm on Instagram and Facebook at the Running Rules. I'm more active on Instagram. Um, there's quite a lot of freebies if you want to go to the website. So um, they could be useful. I've got some nutrition guides on there, and um, some marathon guides and some pacing planners and things like that. So. Um, that's where you can find me but I've really enjoyed this thank you so much for, for talking to me um, no so I'll make sure I have all the links in the show notes so for anybody who wants to find you it'll be super easy that way and thank you so much that was so helpful and I feel like, like kind of like you said we didn't really touch on everything there's so much more we could talk about but I really appreciate all of your time thanks so much thank you I just want to thank Alan so, so much, not just for giving his time and all of his really awesome information, 
but also for putting up with me having to podcast while also chasing my son around who would not stay put while we were trying to interview. So um, always appreciate a patient guest. Also just super great to get to talk with him and get all of the information that he gave us today. All of the links to be able to find him are in the show notes. Also, all of the Spotify listeners look for the poll to see things that we want to learn more from Alan, because hopefully we can convince him to come back and give us a little more information. I know there was stuff we didn't get a chance to get to because we, you know, we talked so much about all the other fueling things. So please put some questions in there. Also, if you follow us on Instagram, I'll make sure I put in a story, um, a poll for any questions you want us to ask Alan. And then if we can have him back, I'll make sure we get to those as well. Thank you for tuning into Raising Runners, new episodes every Tuesday, and we are always looking to talk to people about running, mental health, or anything along the spectrum that can help our young athletes, or just talking to runners or parents and coaches of our young runners as well. Hopefully, you find our resources helpful. If you have questions, comments, or anything else, feel free to email me at marikeerunclub at gmail.com.